Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, welcome, welcome, and welcome to those of you who are watching at home. I am so excited to see all of you here today. As you know, we are the Real News Network and we are coming to you live. For those of you that are at home, we're coming to you live from Ida B's table. And we are here to celebrate the life, the legacy, and the radical spirit of a pioneering journalist, a civil rights activist, and an anti-lynching activist. I'm sure you can guess her name, right? What is her name? Ida B. Ida B. Wells, absolutely. And I'm sure you know the young lady that we have joining us this evening to celebrate this 156th birthday of Ida B. Wells. I think we know her name as well. But she is also a former senator of Ohio. She was a surrogate for Bernie Sanders during the Democratic presidential uh, election in 2016. And she is the president of Our Revolution, which is an organization that Bernie Sanders founded a few years ago in order to uh, elevate political, oh, when you lose your words and you're talking, isn't that the worst? <laughs> in order to elevate political consciousness, you know, um, she, uh, she leaves me speechless. I have Miss Nina Turner over here. Senator Nina Turner, I want all of you to be prepared to be inspired. She is going to join uh, Michelle Duster, the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells. She's gonna be with us, as I talked to you earlier, she's gonna be with us via Skype, because unfortunately her plane was canceled today, so she wasn't able to make it. Um, so, but I wanna thank all of you for coming out today. I wanna thank each and every one of you for being here live, those of you that are watching at home. And Senator Nina Turner, are you ready to join us? <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Wow, it's so wonderful to be here this evening with all of you at Ida B's table. And if you've not eaten here, oh my God, you are in for a treat. And my favorite are the, the greens. I just got to put it out, the greens and the, and the cornbread. So it's gonna be a great night as we really, you know, celebrate and, and really recognize the legacy of, of, of Miss, Miss Ida B. Wells, and she is often forgotten a lot, not talked about a lot, and maybe it's because she was such a rebel with a cause, such a radical. And we should not be afraid of the word radical because it just simply means getting to the root of the matter, and that's exactly what she did. So I, I can't wait. I just want to get right to our conversation with her great-granddaughter, Miss Duster. But there are a few quotes I wanted to share with you all. And um, she certainly was a quote machine, but she told it like it, as my grandmother would say, told it like it is. Oh, Lord, I'm losing everything. Okay, so one of my favorite quotes about her that I think really set the stage in knowing that she realized what her mission was, what her calling was. And she did not run from that calling. And she was just such a bold force. She would be considered bold bold even in the 21st century but my god the fact that she understood her agency and she controlled her voice so she said these words she said somebody must show that the afro-american race is more sinned against than sinning and it seems to have fallen upon me to do so now so sister wells she understood her purpose her mission and her calling at a time where she could just be flat out killed just because of her very existence and to be that bold during that time period says a lot. There are three words that come to mind when I think about Madam Ida B. Wells and it is truth teller. She told the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Number two, revolutionary. That she was very much a visionary and a revolutionary, someone ahead of her time. And not that did she just defend herself, but she defended the right of African Americans in the United States of America to be treated as equals in this country and to launch and to, to really use her investigative journalism skills to dig into the lynching situation in this country. And not only to dig into it, but to call it out was bold. And then my last word is fierce. She was the fiercest of them all. So as we 
think about her and her legacy and what she means to us. And I hope that everybody is formulating their questions because Ms. Duster and I were going to have a Q&A towards the end of this. And I do want you to all to know that we must thank the Real News Network and the people who support Ida B's table. Can we give it up for them? Because it is just so wonderful that they would carry out her legacy and understand how important she is, not just to African-American history, but to America's history. African-American history is America's history, and we don't have to wait till February to talk about it. It's 365. And if you are not a supporter of The Real News, I want to encourage you to do that, to have the, in, the independent journalism, for them to be able to tell stories and talk about issues that you might not necessarily see or hear on mainstream media. We must support The Real News. So without further ado, I want to bring into our conversation Ms. Michelle Duster. And she is the great granddaughter of the one and only Ida B. Wells. And she and I, we're gonna have a discussion and conversation too, but she's gonna open up and talk about her great grandmother. And then she and I are gonna have a dialogue. I got some juicy questions I wanna ask her about her great grandmother. And then we're gonna open it up uh, to all of you. So without further ado, Ms. Duster, how are you? Yes. Okay. We can hear you. So tell us, you know, this is your time to open up in any way that you want. Tell us a little bit about your great grandmother and then you and I are gonna have a dialogue back and forth. Uh, well, my great grandmother uh, was born a slave in 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. And as, you, as a lot of people I'm sure already know, she um, started her career as a, ter as a teacher and ultimately ended up into journalism. And, uh, and then that led her to being anti-lynching crusader, used her skills as a writer to um, document what was going on regarding lynching. And that led into being a full-out uh, civil rights activist. Um, and she worked to document the injustices that were happening to African Americans at the time she was alive. She also advocated for economic boycotting. Hello? Hello? We can hear you. There's, there's, there's a major echo on my Hello? Is that better? Uh, no, it's, it's just a total echo um, on my end. But, um, so I don't know if, can you hear me? Hello? We can, we can hear okay. you. Okay. It's just an echo on my so Everything I say is being repeated to me. <laughs> They're trying to fix it. Okay. Try, try, try again. Okay. Uh, now, hello. Is that any better? Hello. Um. Yeah. Now. I and yes. Okay. You can hear me. And. Okay, so there's no echo anymore. <laughs> you were you were telling the story of uh, uh, yeah. yeah, there's still an echo. Okay, that's <laughs> oh, how about now? Um, right. Well, when I'm talking right now, I don't hear an echo. We can try again. Okay, I'm talking. Can you hear me? Because I don't hear an echo right now. Yes, we hear you loudly and clearly. 
Okay, great. Um, so, so as I was saying, my great grandmother um, used her journalism skills to basically um, counter the narrative of what was going on regarding lynching at the time, and she advocated for economic boycotts um, to counter the um, the system that she knew was unfair. She realized that the legal system was part of the problem, as well as the um, the police force. She knew that they were part of the problem. So she felt the only weapon she had was to either shame the powers that be and or um, hit them, you know, economically in order to force change. Later in her career, she got involved with the suffrage movement, and um, she was one of the founders of the NAACP. And in Chicago, she got involved in local issues and found it one of the first, she found it the first um, kindergarten for black children. And she also got involved in um, providing housing for migrants who were coming up from the South to Chicago. So over the course of her lifetime, she got involved in multiple um, initiatives that were involved in basically creating equal rights for African Americans as well as women. Um, so she was involved in a lot of different things over the course of her life. Was and you know just to set the historic context and notice she was born in in 1862. That was right before slavery was abolished in, in this country. So actually, you know she was born into slavery as you mentioned, and for her to go from that all the way to the crusader that she was and that and I say is because her spirit still lives on. So Ms. Dessa, you talked about the fact that she, I mean, people know her as an investigator investigative journalists, they know her as an activist, they know her as a teacher, but when you and I had our brief conversation, you brought up the point that it is important for us to see your great-grandmother through the lens of a businesswoman. So can you go a little deeper in into that and what being a businesswoman allowed her to do in the movement and also in self-determination? Right. Um, I mean, this is just my personal way of thinking about my great grandmother. Um, and that, that has thinking about her in this way has helped me make some of decisions in my own life. And that is how she was involved with her own destiny regarding from a standpoint of economics. Um, she wasn't just a writer. She was not just a journalist, which there's nothing wrong with that. And that's not to disparage people who are journalists only, but the fact that she not only decided to write about what was going on, um, and she was an extremely effective um, and powerful journalist, but she also decided to own the newspapers that she wrote for. And I think that is a huge thing to take into consideration when it comes to how powerful she managed to become. Um, because she owned the newspaper, she co-owned the newspaper, she could make decisions on her own as far as what would be covered and how it would be covered, um, what voice there would, the, the stories would be told in without having to get permission from the powers that be, um, if you will. So I think that makes a big difference because if you are the owner of the, the news outlet, then that gives you a sense of freedom to report the news in the way that you feel is the best way to get the information out. Um, so she co-owned the Memphis Free Speech and Headlight, which she shortened to the Memphis Free Speech. Um, she, then when she got run out of Memphis and ultimately ended up in New York, she um, teamed up with T. Thomas Fortune, and he asked her if she could um, give him the subscription base for her for the Memphis Free Speech, and she made a deal with him that in, in exchange for the subscription list, she, she needed to have a quarter percent um, ownership of the New York age, which I think about like what kind of negotiation skills did that take on her part? I mean, she, she really thought about how to leverage her power when it came to her, um, what she had already amassed with the Memphis Free Speech to leverage that into ownership of the um, New York age. And then um, 
after she got married to Ferdinand Barnett, he had owned a newspaper, The Conservator, in Chicago, which was the first black-owned newspaper in Chicago. And she ended up, I mean, I'm sure they worked out some kind of a deal with, you know, with a married couple, but the the newspaper ended up being transferred into her name as far as, far as her having full ownership of the newspaper. So in her course of her lifetime, she had full or partial ownership of three different newspapers. And then on top of that, when it came to her pamphlets, she wrote um, a total of, I think, six different pamphlets, and she produced all of them herself. She published them herself. Um, and she got the money to publish all of them through crowdfunding. Um, so I think that is a really huge thing to consider. Everything that she published um, after she got into uh, journalism full time, she owned. She owned the outlets for them. And that, that certainly gave her independence. And Ms. Dustin, when you said crowdfunding, we all kind of smiled because <laughs> just think what she could have done with the 21st century tools that we have today because she was, she was really breaking it down. Um, and then oh, yeah. one of the, the quotes that really, I think, feed into what you're talking about, just seeing Ida B. Wells through the economic lens and the lens of independence for a woman, no doubt, but especially an African-American woman to have that kind of, of independence and... And uh, I think we talked briefly about her being able to self-fund the Senate when she ran for the Senate. But I want to read this quote right. before it, you talk a little bit about that run for the Senate. But she said the following. She said, the appeal to the white man's pocket has ever been more effectual than all the appeals ever made to his conscience. <laughs> right? and, and I mean, that was true right. then. It is true now. At basically understanding the environment that she had to navigate and knowing that the system itself was not necessarily going to respond to a moral appeal as much as it would move based on economics. Right. She understood that very well. Um, and the first um, foray of hers into sort of economic power, because you have to remember, I mean, even more then than it is now, the African American community did not have a whole lot of financial resources or financial power. So, um, as far as ownership of different industries and things like that, so what they did have was power as far as being consumers. And after her friends were lent, she had three friends who owned a grocery store um, that was in competition with a white-owned grocery store, and ultimately the um, the owners of the white-owned grocery store figured out how to get rid of the competition by basically lynching um, the, the three men, the three black men who owned the grocery store, who were really good friends of, of my great-grandmother. And um, since she figured out, and I'm, I'm sure she wasn't the only one who figured out, that the people who were involved with lynching her friends were the law, um, they suspected that they were the uh, sheriff and lawyers and judges um, who were in the community. So. They felt, they meaning my great-grandmother and others in the community, felt that it was impossible to get any kind of justice um, from a legal standpoint when the people who are perpetrating the crimes are the legal system. So the only um, tools they had was economic. So there were two, well, three-pronged um, strategy that she used. One was to encourage people to boycott the streetcars. Um, so... People, you know, did that. Now, this is in 1892, however many years, 60 years or so before um, the Montgomery boy, uh, bus boycott. Um, so this was in Memphis. They boycotted the streetcars. And then she urged through her newspaper writings for people to boycott uh, white owned stores. <laughs> so, you know, they would feel the, the wrath of not having consumers. Um, and then on top of that, she urged people to just leave Memphis and where they couldn't get, you know, any kind of justice. So when you have an entire community, I mean, thousands of people left Memphis as a result of, I'm sure, my great grandmother's appeal, as well as um, other things. I'm not sure if she's 100 percent responsible for what happened, but she certainly helped um, spread the message of 
Um, so those three things, either leave Memphis completely and go to another location, which a lot of the people left and went to either Oklahoma or California um, in order to have a more just and equitable life. Um, or if you're going to stay in Memphis, then just don't shop at the white owned grocery stores and don't use the streetcars. And it was effective enough so that the people who owned the streetcar company came to her printing uh, press and urged her to basically shut up and stop talking about this um, because they were losing so much money. And so then that made her feel even more vindicated and say, you know, let's do it some more, let's do it even longer. <laughs> so the effect of the people coming to her printing press, basically threatening her, um, emboldened her even more because she knew that what she was suggesting was effective. So she was very, she was very savvy in understanding that there is no, um, you can't really appeal to the moral compass of people who really, you know, feel that it's a good thing to get rid of you. So then how about you uh, make sure that they feel your absence by not uh, participating in their commerce? Right. No. So, and, and, and that is a technique that works even to this day. So just yes. thinking, <laughs> ab thinking about, um, so why did she, we talked about, why, why do you think your great-grandmother left the NAACP? She, my great-grandmother was considered radical um, at that time, extreme, uh, uncompromising, and she felt very strongly that the way to counter the problems of the time was to confront them head on and, um, and demand you know, equal justice right then and there. Um, she did not feel that it was reasonable to wait forever to have equality. And she felt that the NAACP at that time, um, first of all, there were about 60 people who were the founders of the NAACP. And I don't know the exact numbers, but I know that the, the African Americans who were um, part of the founders were in the minority. <laughs> um, so the NAACP was predominantly white um, at that time. And she felt that the approach that people felt comfortable taking when it came to examining and solving the problems of the time was too focused on research and examining the problem and thinking about it and let's analyze this. And she felt that there wasn't enough action. Um, it was it was too sort of academic approach and theoretical approach um, for her. So that was, she just got frustrated and felt like, you know, while you guys are thinking about this, I'm gonna do something. Amen to that. Ms. Duster, I get accused of that a little bit myself. <laughs> <laughs> Uncompromising, don't want to wait. Which brings me to this, you know, I wonder, you know, this modern day label of African American women who are assertive, who live their truth, who speak their truth, who dare to have agency, who understand that black people are no longer on a plantation uh, because our ancestors paid the price for us not to be on one. And what that means is that they paid a price for us to be able to have our own independent thought. And your great grandmother, my God, I mean, she led independent thought, even fighting against, or, you know, not just even the NAACP, but even some of her contemporaries who were African American too. She didn't just fight the power structure that was you know, white controlled, but she also fought among her peers in the African American community who also thought, you know, that she was a little too radical. So just thinking about the term angry black woman, do you mm -hmm. think that your great grandmother would be considered an angry black woman? Probably. <laughs> um, I think I, I mean, she, she probably would be considered today the same way that she was considered during her time, which was um, outspoken, outrageous, uncompromising, difficult. Um, what other adjectives can we think of <laughs> that, that are used to women who definitely have strong opinions, who are willing to speak their minds, who are not um, willing to sort of kowtow to the powers that be. Um, she you know, was a straight shooter. She was a straight speaker about what she really felt. 
Um, she was obviously very smart and willing in, in kind of thinking around problems, um, but she she wasn't really willing to just kind of play coy. Um, so I think probably the same things that were said about her would be said about her today. Um, I, I mean, angry black woman, maybe... Um, probably would be cons labeled her but i probably ridiculous and and um uh, outrageous and difficult um you know those kind of, those type of things would probably be used to describe her oh all with a purpose though i, I like to say that all angry black women unite and we take in applications everybody can be an angry black woman with a purpose <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, there's reason to be angry, you know, and, and I think that when people, you know, use those labels to define women who are bringing to fore the, the problems that are real and, you know, the response is, oh, you're being unreasonable, you know, just kind of sit over in the corner and be quiet and wait your turn is, you know, I, I mean, I feel that that's sort of a patronizing way to view black women or women in general. Um, I mean, I noticed, uh, you know, even during the 2016 election, how some people were labeled shrill. Um, <laughs> and I've never heard a man be labeled as shrill. So, I mean, they're just words that are used um, to cap to sort of describe women that are not used when it when it comes to describing men. Um, and the, if, if men were had the same qualities and were acting in the same way, those words, that language would not be used for men. So it really is, um, you know, a very uh, specific thing that women have to deal with. Yeah, to totally agree. So I'm going to read something for you to respond to, and then I we're going to open up to the audience so they can join us in this conversation. <laughs> but just think. I wish I could see everybody. I can't see anything. <laughs> Miss Duster, so she knows we can see her and Hi. hear her and feel her. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm so disappointed that I can't be there with you. I really am disappointed, but this is the next best thing, right? <laughs> it is. Thank God for technology. But I. <laughs> yeah here to feel all the love in this room and every you can hear a pin drop every time you talk I mean we're leaning on your every every word so oh, wow. I don't know where Paul, Paul J we said we got to get a do-over next year so that we're side by side so we're gonna do this again next year so you and I are side by side so I'm reading this excerpt from a book called they say Ida B Wells and the reconstruction of race and so the act of lynching she discovered, talking about your great grandmother in 1892, was the center of the, of the reconstruction. Eight Negroes lynched, she, ang she, she wrote angrily. One at Little Rock, Arkansas last Saturday morning where the citizens broke into the penitentiary and got their man. Three near Anniston, Alabama. One near New Orleans. And three at Clarksville, Georgia. The last three for killing a white man and five on the same old racket. The new alarm about raping white women. The same program of hanging, then shooting bullets into their lifeless bodies was carried out to the letter. Nobody in this section of the country believes the old thread bare lie that Negro men rape white women. If Southern white men are not careful, they will overreach themselves and public sentiment will have a reaction. This is what your great grandmother said, or she wrote in 1892 as she began to, and, and as the author said, angrily, and you could feel the passion in her voice. I could just see the pen going across the page as she was writing about, she, she was capturing not just her feelings as an individual, but the feelings of an entire race of people, or ethnic group of people who have had to bear the brunt of racism and bigotry and discrimination, so much so that they lost their lives for it. 
but she was willing to call it straight out and call it what it what it was which as you linked led to the lynching of her three friends because it was all, all about economics and uppity black folks and black people getting out of their space so when she was writing those words and hearing those words what what comes to mind for you about her in that moment um, well, she actually wrote those words <clears throat> after her friends were lynched. Um, and so that is why she wrote it, because she realized that her friends were not um, guilty of any crimes against white women. I mean, she knew that her friends were obviously business owners and they were very smart people. They were leaders in the community, um, and especially Thomas Moss, who was her, her really a friend, a good enough friend of hers so that she was the godmother of his daughter. So they were kind of like family um, by today's terms um, since her, her parents had died when she was 16. So, at that time that, that um, Thomas Moss and um, Will Stewart and Calvin McDowell were, were killed, Ida was living in Memphis by herself, um, even though she had taken care of her siblings as long as she could. But um, her, her uh, sisters ultimately ended up moving out to California with her aunt, and then her brothers um, had stayed back in Mississippi. So she was in Memphis by herself as a young woman. She was around 30 years old at that time. And so for her to lose her three friends was just devastating. And on top of that, she knew that they were innocent. She knew Thomas Moss in particular was, um, well, first of all, he was a what they called a letter carrier, um, which was a, a prestigious job, you know, to work for the federal government that shortly after slavery had ended. So he was considered like kind of on the elite side and um, a really big leader in the community. She was really good friends with him. And then um, Will Stewart and Calvin McDowell were also um, businessmen. So when those, when the three of them were killed and she knew for a fact that they were upstanding citizens and leaders in the community, she put two and two together and figured out how many other people are being lynched who are innocent of these type of crimes that they're being accused of? How many of them are leaders in the community? And how many of them are being killed because they're leaders in the community? So she realized that lynching was being used to um, keep the African-American community down, because if you get rid of the leaders, then the community you know, is a little dis destabilized um, economically and um, even emotionally. So that is why she wrote that. Um, and she also realized that black men were being accused of raping white women. She wrote something else, which I'm not sure if you have a copy of, where she basically um, said that bl white men are um, accusing black men of raping white women. But at the same time, white men feel like they can, you know, humiliate and violate black women with impunity. Um, and so why are black men being um, killed for what could be consensual situations? And she realized that some of the liaisons that were happening between black men and white women were consensual. And what was happening was that white women were crying rape when somebody found out about the liaison. So um, that was what, what she meant by that, uh, what she wrote was, you know, that some of these situations were consensual and the women after the fact were, were crying rape. Hey, no, um, absolutely. And then I, I want to, I mean, that is just so deep and, and we know, I mean, if we just even go back to the legacy of, of slavery where black women and black men, we don't talk a lot about that, just could not even control their own bodies. You know, and so this legacy, and so just the fact that oh, yeah. this accusation would be just bantied against black men as, and given license to be lynched in that way in this country for, you know, generations. So, I mean, she was just really, she just told it like it was, the whole truth and nothing but the truth at all times. So I want to draw all of our attention to Ida in her own words. And this book right here was edited by Miss Michelle Duster, her great granddaughter. So I want to encourage folks to, to purchase this and support your work 
of editing your great grandmother. So I want to bring I want to bring the audience in on this if we can, because I, I have one more serious question, but I'm going to save it for last. <laughs> but but I want to okay. bring in the audience here. I want you to know, Ms. Duster, that the room is filled to capacity, and um, everybody is just feeling the love, and, and just the, it's just quite an honor, I would say. I'm going to speak on behalf of everybody in the room. Tracy, you coming back up? Everybody in the room where we say that we are so, <laughs> so honored just to to have you with us and to be able to get as close and personal as we can to be in your head in terms of your family legacy and all that your great grandmother has done for America in revealing one of its greatest sins in this country was lynching and the fact that it even took so long for this country even to come to grips with that and in many ways some of that is still happening I mean just reading your great grandmother's quote reminds me of what's going on in our country right now where you have some white people who think it's okay just to call uh, the police on black folks for sleeping in cars or sleeping in dorm rooms you know and, and really you know setting them up to have their their lives put on the line uh, one of the most recent ones that I saw was a, a African-American man was dropped off someone and he was sitting in his car for 30 minutes because his yoga class was around the corner and a white woman was walking down the street and she looked in the car and saw him and said he didn't belong in this neighborhood, you know, and, and flat out called the police on him. And luckily there was not a violent encounter, but it could have happened. And we see that more and more, you know, right now in the 21st century in this country that people, and that's not just happening by happenstance, it's happening because of the legacy of racism and discrimination in this country, where people know there's a certain response when you say it's a black man, you know, or a certain response if it's a black woman, but a certain response if there's a black man who is the being accused. Yeah, you know, um, I have two comments about that. One is um, actually um, what you're talking about as far as white people calling the police for everything on black people. Um, that actually happened to a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, a couple of days ago. You might have heard about this case of, um, now they've called him Coupon Carl, um, <laughs> which is uh, at CVS, a friend of mine was at CVS to get something and the guy didn't recognize the coupon. He thought it was fraudulent and then ended up calling the police on her. So now this has become personal to me. I mean, I was reading about these different um, e situations that you just mentioned, but I never imagined that I would actually personally know somebody this would happen to. So this is really getting interesting just to see the level um, of boldness on, you know, saying every, anything and everything that black people are doing is, um, is considered threatening. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, um, I just, this is sort of a joke. <laughs> um, I just, I found it interesting that um, all of the flights coming out to the East Coast were canceled today, um, considering what happened yesterday. And I was like, hmm, maybe I have a conspiracy theory here, but I just found that to be very interesting. That's never happened to me in my life, where flights are canceled for eight hours, um, all going to New York, Boston, I mean, New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. So I'll just leave it there and see. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that, but I'm really disappointed that I can't be there. Yeah, we are too. We, yeah, you got me thinking about that now. I don't know. <laughs> it, may, it, it crossed my mind and I'm like, okay, maybe I'm just being paranoid, but I'm like, this is awfully strange. <laughs> Yes, it is. But we're going to we're going to get our do over. So Paul J nodded his head. We're going to get our do over. So <laughs> Tracy, are we ready to open it up to the audience? All right. We are ready. Here we go. So you're going to get a chance to ask a question. I, just so that we can get as many questions in as possible. Family, please. Can you ask a question so that Miss Duster will have the opportunity to interact with as many people as possible? So Tracy has the mic. Who has the very, we have our first question over there, Tracy. I can try it again, okay. I got a question too. All right, yes, it's going. So first of all, I think you have Ida B. Wells' eyes, which are completely fabulous. So thank you for that. <laughs> The other thing that I would love for you to talk about is how incredibly 
brave and courageous she was. It wasn't just about being, you know, an activist, but they lynched black women then, and especially uppity black women. So it's not like she was speaking out and didn't have to fear for herself. So I would love for you to talk about what the incredible bravery and courage she had her whole life. Right. I'm glad you used those words, um, courageous and, and brave. Um, I actually prefer that way of describing her versus fearless. Um, and that's just me. Um, but I just think fearless implies that there was no fear. And I don't believe that she had no fear at all. I just believe that she she probably she had to be, a, you know, nervous or afraid or, you know, just have some kind of emotional response. But I feel that she that she believed that um fighting against the the oppression and the terrorism that was in her world at that time was more important than living um in, in, under those conditions without and just kind of accepting that as the way it should be i think that the fact that she came of age during reconstruction was a huge part of what made her who she was um because she grew up you know during a time when there was a sense of hope and a lot of progress um and also she saw her father um take advantage of all of the opportunities that became available right after slavery ended as far as the um, having the right to vote is the right to own property um she was a, she grew up in sort of a politically savvy engaged family and so she truly believed from just the way that she was raised that she, her voice was important um and so i you know when like the quote that she has that she would rather one would rather die fighting um, against injustice and to die like a rat or, um, or a dog or a rat in a trap. Um, I think that she believed that she, I think she truly believed that she would rather die than to live with that kind of oppression. Um, so she felt that, that the cause that she was fighting for was worth dying for, but she also uh, made a promise to herself that if somebody tried to kill her, she would kill somebody. She would take as many people with her as she could. So um, <laughs> um, she, I mean, she's people, um, you know, feel they like to quote the fact that she carried a pistol with her. Um, and I think that was for self-protection, obviously, because people were absolutely threatening her life. And so the fact that she was very focused on the fact that she would not just be a pushover and, you know, just kind of roll over and die, but she was going to fight to the end. Um, so that was brave and courageous of her to decide to just keep going instead of taking the safe route and deciding, well, I'll, I guess I'll just be quiet now and, and accept this humiliation and degradation um, and just absolute um, level of being insulted in every way, shape or form for the rest of her life. I mean, she just did not feel like that was something she would, that, that would be okay for her. So, yeah, I mean, she, she definitely was willing to face the people who wanted to do her harm with every last drop of um, energy that she had versus just kind of meekly going away. Thank you. Paul J. Uh, Michelle and Nina, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, Michelle, uh, I Ida B. was a serious investigative journalist. And one of the things she did is she acquired, investigated, and assembled a lot of data on the scale of the lynchings. And could you talk a bit about what she found? Because I don't think many people have an idea just what the scale of all this was. Um, well, I mean, she, when, after her, three friends were lynched in Memphis, which was actually quite unusual. Um, lynching was taking place during the time, during that time. But from what I understand, most of the lynchings were not in 
urban areas. They were more in rural areas. And so the lynching of her friends was shocking to to uh, not, not just Ida, but the entire community. Um, so after that happened, she decided to travel around um, in different areas when she heard about lynchings that had taken place and she would travel there in the South, in the uh, Mississippi and, Miss and Memphis or Tennessee area and talk to people and find out their stories about what happened. And time and time again, she was finding situations where Either the crime, if you want to call it the crime that somebody was um, accused of was very minor or ma manufactured, or if there were some kind of liaison between white women and, and black men, it, most of the time it was consensual and the woman would cry rape after, um, if they were caught, you know, like if a woman was having um, an affair and, the, and then they found that the person she was having an affair with was a black man, then she would say, oh, he raped me. Um, so that's what she was finding as she went around and, and um, investigated these different lynchings that took place. After she was run out of the South, um, then she, I, it was really interesting to me because she, she hired, um, I, I think mostly white men to go south to invest, to, to do, uh, to do the same kind of questioning, um, when, when it came to these lynchings and find out exactly what happened. And I always wondered how did she find out that information about all these lynchings that took place in the South after she was exiled from the South and she, and her life was absolutely in danger. And that's what made sense to me after I learned that, that she actually hired investigative investigators to go down to the South. And it made sense that they were white men because they could more easily gather the information without their lives being, um, you know, as in danger as it would have been for somebody else to do that same kind of investigation. So, um, that's all. That's pretty much what I can say. I mean, she she just kind of heard about the lynchings after the fact. I mean, obviously it would have to be after the fact, and then um, send somebody to to find out what happened. Um, so as far as I know, she would read about the lynchings that take place in the newspapers, and then send somebody to find out what what the truth was behind what happened. Thank you. Our next question. Oh, Hi. right here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Who's next? Okay. Oh, um, Alicia Phillips. Uh, I have one question, and it's if your great grandmother was alive today, what advice do you think she would give for the black community, especially the black youth, on how to organize themselves? Um, I can only guess what she might think about, you know, how to deal with things today. Um, I mean, I, I'm guessing it would be some of the same things that, that she advocated for during her time, which is economic, um, just organizing around economics, because, I mean, this country is a capitalist country and money talks. So, you know, it's happened before. Um, it happened during her time. It happened, obviously, a lot during the 1960s when people were boycotting in, in very organized ways. Um, so when, when entities and organizations are losing money, then all of a sudden they realize, oh, wow, maybe we should talk to these people about what, what are, what exactly are their, are their issues that they want to have addressed. Um, I would say, honestly, that, that probably is more than likely the, the biggest thing, um, is just to organize economically, um, because, you know, you can, you can march in the streets, um, which is, which is effective, but if people aren't affected financially, you know, it's kind of like, okay, there they go again, you know, just screaming around in the streets with signs, but they don't seem to really care if it doesn't affect them. So basically any in every way that whatever people's actions are affects um, an entity in a way that has meaning to them, I think would be whatever strategy she would uh, advocate for. Um, people don't really care if you're mad, if it doesn't affect their lives. That's so true. We, we need to, okay, so let's get, okay, next question, and then we're going to come on this side. Okay. Uh, there's a famous quote attributed to your great-grandmother pertaining to the Winchester rifle. 
uh, I wonder if you could share that with us. I'm not sure if I can say the quote off the top of my head, but I, I think it was something along the lines of every African American or Afro American family should have a Winchester in their house. Um, and I know that quote has been co-opted by organizations that I'm not sure if my great grandmother would actually be in alignment with them um, because I think it's slightly taken out of context. Um, I think what she meant when she was advocating for every Afro-American family to have a Winchester was that she, you have to remember that she lived during a time when literally there were night riders um, going around in, 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 going to people's homes and dragging people out of their house in the middle of the night and burning up their house and stringing them from a tree and shooting bullets in them. And so there was no law. Um, it was complete lawlessness. It was complete, um, absolute, you know, brutality and um, with with impunity. I mean, and somebody came to kill her, she would take somebody out with them, that, um, that she would take a lyncher, as many of them out with her as possible because she knew she, there was no 911 at that time. And even if there were, her feeling and the feeling among the community was that the people who would respond for the 911 were the murderers. They were the they were the people who were perpetrating the the violence. So who do you call if the law are the ones that are committing the murders? Right. Our next question. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Elva Tillman and. You talked a little bit about the NAACP and her interactions with them. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about some of the other organizations, because from the reading that I've done about Ida B, I thought that she influenced a number of other organizations. Right. Well, I mean, she traveled to England in 1893. And while she was traveling over there, she saw and experienced women who were forming women's clubs at that time. And that wasn't happening in the United States. And what she saw was women organizing in these clubs in order to influence politics. You have to remember that at, this, at the time that my great grandmother was living most of her life, uh, women did not have the right to vote. And so the only way they could have any kind of political influence was to organize themselves and then as a group put pressure on men in order to vote in certain ways or to influence elections so that certain men would be elected by influencing the men to vote for these other men. Um, and so at the time, my, after she came back from England, when she came back to this country, she was her attitude was like, hey, you know, American women need to organize in the same way that they're organizing in, in the UK and Britain. Um, so when she came back to Chicago, she had that idea and they formed the Ida B. Wells Club. Um, the women decided to name it after Ida B. Wells. And that was a big part of what they were doing was organizing in political ways um, so she was very involved in that organization. She was also invo involved in the national, uh, was it the National uh, Association of Colored Women, um, which was also, you know, focused on sort of social and political issues at the time. She was a, a member of numerous organizations, and honestly, I just can't remember the names of all of them. Um, but those are the two that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, but I think... Um, like I said, a lot of the focus of these organizations that she was involved in was around social and political issues in lieu of the fact that women did not have the right to vote. And so it was a, a form of self-determination and influence um, on, on the political system. So. Yeah, th yeah, thank you so much for that. We have time for one more question. and. Uh, Ms. Duster, I did find that quote from your grandmother where she said, I felt that one had better die fighting against injustice than to die like a dog or a rat in a trap. I had already determined to sell my life 
as dearly as possible if attacked. I felt if I could take one lyncher with me, this would even up the score a little bit. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, Sister Wells just made it plain, you know. If I go, I ain't going by myself. Somebody coming Absolutely. with me. And you know, it's funny because, um, I, I mean, I'm related to Ida B. Wells on my father's side of the family. My grandmother, okay, so my grandmother was Ida's daughter, her youngest daughter. And then my father was um, one of the five children of my grandmother. Um, but it's just so interesting to me that my father um, married a woman who I think had a lot of Ida's spirit in her. My mother grew up in the South and she had exactly the same attitude. You know, she, she, she my mom was so funny cause she was like, um, there was no way she could have joined that, um, the peaceful protest because she was like, if somebody hits me, I'm hitting them right back. <laughs> um, so she had that same kind of attitude. A very natural instinct that we, uh, resist as human beings to, to, to do that mm -hmm. and it's hard to do that so we have time for one more question from the audience Ms. Duster and then I have my one last question yes ma'am hi I'm ER ship uh, before my question I would really like to commend to everyone that you visit the new lynching memorial in Montgomery I went there a few weeks ago it's amazing and it puts in it makes real what we read about in Ida B. Wells' Southern Horrors and other reports that she did. Uh, my question is, I think I've seen somewhere that there are efforts to have a national monument built to her. Can you say something about what's going on? Oh, yes. I've been involved in that project for now 25% of my adult life. <laughs> um, it's a project that we're working on here in Chicago. We meaning that there's a committee that I'm a member of who um, is very focused on getting a monument created to honor my great grandmother. It will be located on the land where the Ida B. Wells homes once stood for over 60 years. And the budget is $300,000. We're getting so close. I mean, yesterday was amazing because it was her birthday and I've uh, connected with several other people around the country who are very interested in this project. And we were cr like crazy busy on Twitter yesterday, just in, uh, asking people to, um, to support this project. And we got an uh, overwhelming um, amount of support um, as a result of that. People are really interested in this project. Um, so we're very close. I think, I don't know the numbers, but about 30,000 away or so from, from our goal, uh, 300,000. Um, it will be uh, created by Richard Hunt, who's an extremely well-known, um, award-winning um, sculptor um, who's Chicago-based. And um, so we have everything that we need to get this mon monument done, except for the last few uh, amount of the uh, final amount of money that we need. I really feel that based on the momentum that we've gained, I, I predict that we will have the money by probably the end of the month. I mean, there's just such an outpouring of support. Um, so this is just an amazing project and it's one of the few monuments that will uh, be um, to recognize a, an African-American woman. one of, and there, It'll be a monument, but I've done a lot of research on statues, even in this country, um, that honor African-American women, and I've only counted 13. And that compares to over eight, almost 800 of the Confederate monuments. So we have a long way to go for African-American women to be in, recognized in the way that they should be in monument and statue form. Yeah, wow. <laughs> And, and Ms. Duster, if anyone wanted to be a part of that, to support it, you said you think that the money might be raised by the end of the month. Is there a website or uh, that someone oh, could yes. go? Yes. Yes. Um, it's, it's really easy to remember. It's Ida B. Wells Monument dot org. Um, Ida B. Wells Monument dot org. Be a part of history. Right. Give some Absolutely. money to that mission. Oh. And just to, give, just to give perspective, yesterday was just, I, I don't think I'll ever forget yesterday as long as I live, um, because I had 
I had been on Twitter for a while just asking people to don't to to man to um support this project and her birthday is July 16th and like can we get this money raised by July 16th not Nowhere did I think that on July 16th, over almost a thousand donations came in one day. Uh, so it was just unbelievable the amount of support. And thus, um, so you know, if we happen to go over the $300,000 mark, which I, I think we might, um, there is a phase two to the project. So it would uh, it would just help us even more to not have to go back out and, uh, and, and do fundraising for the second phase, which will include some smaller pieces that will go in walking distance from the monument. So what Richard Hunt will create is the sort of the focal piece, um, but there will be some other pieces that we'll have around. So the whole idea is that when people are doing walking tours or biking tours in Bronzeville, which is the neighborhood where my great grandmother lived her whole life that she was in Chicago, um, and her, her house is a national landmark. Um, so when people are walking in that area, everything is about two blocks apart from each other. So it really will be a very um, dynamic um, piece of history that people will be able to experience and feel the presence of um, not just my great grandmother, but just the sort of the history of Chicago and, and black Chicago in particular, because that neighborhood Bronzeville is where most people settled when they first started the first wave of the migration that came up from the north, pretty much all settled in that area, which was called the Black Belt at that time. Thank you for that. So again, that's Ida B. Wells monument.org. Please donate. Let's help this come alive and then we can visit Chicago, Chi-Town and then see that monument. Yeah. And what I, can I just say one last thing? I've told people, you know, when you get, when you donate online, you get that little receipt saying, hey, you donated. You can print that out, laminate it, you know, save it for the rest of your life, show your grandchildren, your great grandchildren that you were part of history. <laughs> Um, and any, any amount helps because, like I said, most of the donations, I mean, I was watching them, the, people donated between $3 and $100. Most of the donations were in that range. And it all added up yesterday. We raised $40,000 in 24 hours. It was unbelievable. Um, so everything helps. Everything does help. But many hands make for light work. So let's put our hands together and put some money to the mission. Absolutely. So, Ms. Duster, I was going to ask my last question, but I think I'm going to save it. One young lady kind of got close to it. You know, just reflecting on the life and the legacy of your great-grandmother and everything that she is. And I say is because her spirit looms large. Even today, the spirit of Ida B. Wells is with us. And the fact that you are carrying on her legacy and some others in your family just means so much to us because you are a living testimony to all that your great grandmother lived for, fought for, stood for, and she awakened the consciousness of this nation. And, it, and she further reflects the power of one. You know, a lot of times we believe as individuals yeah. we cannot make a difference, but she showed the power of one. And she also had the instinct that if she had to stand alone, she was gonna stand anyhow. And, 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 and that is just such a beautiful thing. She had vision, she had tenacity, she had courage, she was a truth teller, she was a revolutionary, and she was fierce. And I agree with you, not fearless, but fierce. And, and you know what, Ms. Duster, she understood her mission, her assignment. I believe that God gave her that assignment and she stood boldly in her purpose. So the quote that comes to mind before you bring us on home, because you should have the last word as we close this out. But she said this, she said, there must always be a remedy for wrong and injustice if we only know where to find it. Powerful even today. So you get the last words, Miss Michelle Duster. This has been an absolute delight to be with you this, <laughs> this evening. So you bring us on home. Oh, wow. Um, basically, I mean, you kind of summarized it. I, I mean, I feel very strongly that my great grandmother was a testament to obviously the power of one, um, being clear on, on your mission and purpose. Um, I think, you know, the fact that she was willing to stand alone 
um, you know, is important to remember. And she actually did stand alone um, in, in multiple situations. She also endured a lot of criticism. And I think it's important to remember that it wasn't easy. What she did was not easy at all. And um, there were a lot of times, if you read her her. Uh, um, if you read her diary and her autobiography, I mean, she she really expresses how disappointed she felt at times that people didn't back her up or they didn't understand what she was trying to do, um, that that um, she she faced a lot of criticism. And but despite that level of disappointment um, and feeling that that she if she you know there was many crossroads that she faced and the fact that she was like okay well I could just give up and sort of go with the crowd and be quiet and just live a, a nice you know halfway sort of halfway comfortable life because she was a teacher and was considered middle class at that time or you know just do I keep going even though it's not going to be easy and I might be alone and the fact that every single time she came to that crossroads she made the decision to keep going um, even if it meant going alone and even if it meant funding her own initiatives with her own money um, the level of sacrifice that she made personally and financially um, is something that ha I've reflected on a lot when I've made decisions in my own life. Um, and and the fact that she did that has encouraged me to do some of the same things. I mean, just as an example, I decided to self-publish the book that you all have, Ida in her own words, as well as Ida from abroad, because when I thought about my great grandmother and how she did her work, I felt that, you know, in her spirit, I want to do the same thing as far as having control over my own work, um, having uh, as far as the content and having economic control um, because I had worked for quite a while in or other organizations as a writer and I knew that what I wanted to say would probably be tempered um, by others so I wanted to have that level of control and the reason why I decided to take that was because when I thought about how my great-grandmother led her life I was like I can do it too if she did it I can do it and so my last words would be you know just when you think about how she led her life it can be an inspiration to think if she could do it I can do it too and that has been what has helped me make some of my decisions for my own life well amen to that if she could do it I can do it too yeah. please support Miss Duster and her books, Ida from Abroad, and Ida in her own words. Miss Duster, you are your great grandmother's embodiment. You personify her in the 21st century. Thank you so much for that. And thank you, Ida B's Table, and thank you, Real News Network, for keeping it real and bringing a revolutionary to life right here in Baltimore. Please support not only Ida B. Wells Monument.org. We have to help Ms. Duster before you leave here today with these smartphones. You can make a donation before you walk out of this place today. Put your money where your mouths are. Let's support this mission, but also let's support the Real News Network because they keep it real. And they keep it Absolutely. independent. And we would not have not only this wonderful space that honors the life, the legacy, and the work of Ida B. Wells every single day, but to have somebody that was a visionary like Paul Jay and other partners to open up this restaurant in her honor right here in the heart of the African-American community is a beautiful thing. So please support the Real News Network, support the Ida B. Wells Foundation, go to Ida, Ida B. Wells Monument.org and please purchase this book before you leave so that Miss Duster can t continue to walk in her great grandmother's footsteps and be the independent bad woman on the good side that she is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Miss Duster. Thank you all for being here tonight. We love you. Uh, thank you. And I, I want to tell everything you said. I appreciate everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>